Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this 2017 graduation symposium of our program Automotive System Design, officially. My name is Peter Höberger. I'm the coordinator of this program. I'll give you a short introduction, a little bit of a background of why we're here. And then we have a lot of people here that's going to present what they did in the past year. Uh, so let's get. Is this the future of automotive? Maybe Professor Neumeyer knows, but we're not going to talk about this. Or maybe this is the future of automotive. If you combine it with megatronics. Uh, here at TUE, we uh, have a, a specific automotive learning line that, uh, spread over different faculties, departments, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, and mathematical and computer science. And here you see the more traditional line of learning where you do a bachelor and a master. And after your master, you can either go to industry or continue with a PhD. And if you have a PhD, you can either end up again in industry, or a few people end up in academia. And PDN programs are a little bit in the middle. You continue after your master with a PDN, and primarily we train people to become team leaders, project leaders, system engineers in industry, and a very few are so smart that they continue on with a PhD. A few of you are so smart. Um, PDN programs are all connected to technical universities. We used to have three technical universities. It used to be the three TU School for Technological Design. Since last year, we have four universities in that uh, platform because Wageningen University is uh, added there. These are the 21 different PDN programs we have in the Netherlands. And up left, you see Automotive System Design is a program that started in 2011. Some of these programs already exist since 1986, so we have a long history. And two years ago, we added a track called Megatronic System Design, and we have four people here, the first four Megatronic System Design graduates. Uh, so we started in 2011. We had our first graduates in 2013. And some of you may know, but the TOE hands out a Best Design Award every year. And we managed to, uh, to get the, the Design Award uh, three times in a row, uh, almost in a row. We've been accredited, uh, so we're doing things in, in the right way. And so far, we had 36 graduates. And today, we're going to add 10 ASD people and four MSD, Megatronics people. Very roughly, to give you an idea about the structure of these programs, uh, you see a number of blocks here. And the first four blocks is what we call our education modules, where the trainees work in groups, uh, together on workshops and courses, do some small project in, in, as a team. And the fifth block is where they work individually on a design uh, assignment in industry. So all of these guys have been working about well, 10 months in industry, and the mechatronics people do that for a year. That's roughly the idea. Uh, of course, there are many, many people involved. Uh, it's impossible to, uh, to mention them all. You think of teachers, coaches, supervisors, all over the place. I want to mention a few. Professor Hank Neumeyer, who's sitting here, is the scientific director of this program and also the graduate program director of uh, Automotive. Uh, his predecessor was Professor Martin Steinbuch. Judith Beinhacker, somewhere in the audience, is uh, the professional development coach for these people. Uh, we had Frank Jansberg, Ton Pijnenburg. Ellen van Hoof is our secretary, the most important person in this program. Uh, and other people from uh, software technology that we cooperate a lot with uh, in, in the bottom here. Uh, of course, not only me people, but also many companies. And I've seen some representatives from companies here. It's very nice. Here you see the, the main companies that have been involved for this group. But for other groups, we have uh, additional companies. Uh, and of course, we cannot do this without support and, uh, and funding. So we've been funded by the University, uh, Hatas, Automotive NL, Helmond, Pro Province of North Brabant. And of course, we're very, very grateful for that. Today is a celebration day here in this beautiful setting. Uh, here you can become stars. There's a film, film hall. We start with a symposium that will take 
till about three. Uh, we'll have uh, a coffee break from 3.30 till four, and then from four till five, we have a diploma ceremony also in this room. And there will be a reception afterwards. This is roughly the symposium program. Uh, we start with a group of three. Um, why are they grouped together? That's because they all worked in one way or another for Dove trucks. Uh, and of course, they're going to show you what they have designed in the, in the past. Uh, so again, welcome to all of you, uh, relatives, part friends, industrial supervisors, everyone welcome. In the bottom right, I write the word confidential because they're not allowed to show you everything they have been doing. Some of these uh, projects are really, really confidential. Uh, and of course, I welcome all graduates. And the first thing I want you guys to do is to stand up, turn around, and let the audience give you a, a big hand. Okay. Yeah, that's enough. <laughs> Don't exaggerate it. Um, I'm going to introduce most people and then say a few words what their colleagues think about them. Uh, we have 14 graduates, but unfortunately we only have 12 presentations today. One trainee uh, had to leave uh, earlier, uh, Jalila. Jalila Saifu did a project with AM Systems, a cooperation between TNO, Additive Manufacturing and the High Tech Systems Center. Uh, and we have Nestor here, present, but he's not allowed to give a presentation from his company. He did a project uh, with Thermo Fischer Scientific, previously known as FAI. Uh, but I can say what your colleagues think about you. Nestor has great eye for detail and quality. The efficient mind. Very organized, focused and calm. Enjoys to participate in team activities to lead and coordinate. He motivates and brings people to bring out and inspires people to bring out the best. A true coach. That word coach came back a lot. <laughs> He's pragmatic, organized. Nestor is a machine. He works exactly eight hours a day, but he'll achieve double the amount of work. Nestor is a pity that you can't present today, but um, we continue with the DAF consortium. And we'll have first Hazen, that will start. Uh, Hazen has taken simplicity in design and superb planning to the next level. Empathetic, strategic, high level. He might be an engineer today, but he'll definitely be a successful entrepreneur in the, in the future, tomorrow. He's a good promoter and social person, always proposing ideas and suggestions, always thinking about others. Very good team cooperation. Yes, uh, Hazen, the floor is yours. Okay. First of all, thank you, Peter, for the introduction. Uh, yeah, first of all, I will uh, introduce the company that I've been working with uh, for the past 10 months. It's not only me, it's uh, Sapfo, my colleague as well, and Michalis. Is Michalis? Yeah, he is Michalis. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about DAF Trucks first, then I'll talk about my project. So DAF Trucks is a Dutch trucking manufacturing company. Its headquarters actually here is in Eindhoven, and it's part of the Picard Group. So as any other business entity, DAF cares about the return on investment for itself and uh, its customers, of course. Truck efficiency, reliability, safety, and of course, the main challenge of today is reducing the CO2 consumption. Uh, the the emissions. So uh, I will start with a small video about that. <laughs>
I really like this video, but yeah, it was really loud. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. So as I said, I'm working with DAF in cooperation with the TUE. So myself and Michalis, we are part of a bigger uh, entity, Horizon 2020, and also part of the Imperium project. So now I'll start with actually my project. The predictive advanced driving assistance systems functionalities to lower the fuel consumption. So uh, in this project, we offered four different functionalities. Unfortunately, I will not be able to talk about them because of confidentiality, so I'll just give a high-level overview. My DAF supervisor is or was John Cassels, and my university supervisor is Mitch Lazar, and that's me. Uh, yeah. So today's agenda will be discussing the motivation of the project, the background, a little bit about the data analysis that took place, also, we'll discuss the system at hand, then we'll end up with the conclusion and the Q&A section. Doo -doo. Yeah. So, the motivation. Well, currently, the ACC performance on the truck is not at best when it comes to fuel consumption. So, ACC is the adaptive uh, cruise control system. I also have a video for that. So, yeah. So, I think most of you are familiar with the conventional cruise control system, where you just set up the desired speed, let's say at 80 kilometers per hour, and the truck adjusts to that speed. But sometimes you are faced with a preceding vehicle, which is actually slower. So using a front radar, the adaptive cruise control system will lower your velocity to the velocity of the preceding vehicle to maintain a certain time gap between you. So basically that's the adaptive cruise control system for the audience. And yeah. So currently, we have a speed function. So this speed function could be a, another system like predictive cruise control system or cruise control itself. It could be controlling the velocity profile of the truck. Then suddenly, there will be this sudden jump in the velocity profile by the fact that the ACC will take control and will do gradual torque reduction. So what we'll try to do at the moment in this project, that instead of having this sudden shift, that we'll have a smoother transition where the speed the functions will utilize the ACC radar readings in order to do uh, more uh, smoother gradual torque reduction, uh, gradual uh, velocity reduction by the means of early costing. So the main idea here is to replace the existing system from gradually reducing the torque to cost instead. Therefore, save fuel and provide a smoother transition. And here is the PCC system at DAF. Predictive cruise control. On hilly routes, predictive cruise control and predictive shifting can generate fuel savings of around 3%. How? By anticipating uphill and downhill slopes, because the truck uses GPS to choose the ideal speed and acceleration. Let's look at a few examples. The cruise control speed in all of these examples is set at 82 kilometers per hour, and the downhill speed control speed at 89. In addition, the default setting of PCC is set at minus 10. This means that, if necessary, PCC can reduce the set cruise control speed by up to 10 km per hour under the set cruise control speed. In the center, you can see the set distance to the vehicle ahead. The driver can... Yep, so that's the predictive cruise control system, because I kept on saying PCC, PCC. Yep. So that's a sample, that's an actual life sample recorded from a truck. So that's the field da data analysis part. So the blue line represents the speed of the forward vehicle. The red line represents the distance between us and the preceding vehicle. And the green line is our speed. So as you can see here, we are narrowing the gap actually because our speed is higher than the preceding vehicle speed. Nevertheless, at this segment, we are accelerating because, yeah, for example, PCC or CC is in control. Then suddenly the ACC breaks for six seconds. So this behavior is considered that it's not eco-friendly driving behavior because there is no point of accelerating then braking. Yeah, and as you can see here, the driver wasn't in control, so there was no acceleration pedal change or brake pedal change, and the cruise control set speed was around 85. <coughs> this is the window of the change where we could do improvement, a little bit of improvement when it comes to fuel economy. So as you can see here, what the system actually does that is that it does a gradual torque reduction. Instead of costing, instead of just cutting fuel, 
the torque is reduced gradually, then the system itself breaks, the ACC system. Yeah, by the way, this is the engine fuel rate, so that's the amount of uh, fuel entering the engine, and this is the brakes. So in order to change the system, first we had to develop an ACC model for Wright. Wright is the official simulation environment for DAF. So the fact is that they had the, the predictive cruise control system, the cruise control system, and other systems already modeled inside their official simulation environment, but they didn't have the ACC system modeled. So for me, to, in order to start, I need to have a baseline first. So I had to develop the ACC model for Wright, and then simulate it and record the fuel consumption then develop an early coasting block where we could coast instead of just doing the gradual torque reduction and see how would that affect the fuel consumption and record the fuel consumption and compare and see what's the potential fuel saving. And then keep on iterating to improve this uh, ACC early coasting block. Unfortunately, due to confidentiality, I will not be able to state numbers, any kind of numbers. So I just say that the the potential fuel saving number was actually quite satisfactory. At least that's what I've been told from DAFSA. Yeah. So to have a, a high level overview over the system, so that's how the system actually looked like. So we have the inputs and outputs, the driver block inside the simulation environment, the vehicle control block, and the vehicle itself, and the CAN uh, for the communication purposes. So what we added is that we added an ACC block and ACC readings because we didn't have the front radar, for instance. And then we also added the ACC early coasting block. So to sum up, uh, the simulations showed the promising uh, results when it comes to uh, uh, fuel savings. And also we did first experimental, uh, experimental validation to receive the driver feedback on the early coasting mechanism on an actual live truck. So we were able to go on the streets and try a truck and try the system working on it. It was quite exciting. And yeah, basically that was it. Thanks a lot for your time. And now we have time for questions. Anyone? I've seen the, the more extensive presentation, so I have to, to sort of uh, avoid mentioning some of the figures you don't want to mention. I, I understand that. Um, sort of, all in all, this is about smoothing cruise control, adaptive cruise control. Would there be other means? I mean, you, you uh, do this with this predictive cruise control based mechanism. Would you, when you would start again, do it the same way, or could you envision other ways to do so? It's yeah. really about this smoothing effect, which you yeah. explained very well. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, uh, currently what I did is that I changed inside the speed functions, so predictive cruise control or cruise control. So ideally, the best thing is to improve the ACC itself, because this functionality should be provided by the ACC. But unfortunately, the ACC currently present on the DAF trucks, the one provided by a, a supplier, doesn't have these functionalities. And or, in order for DAF truck to request these functionalities from the supplier, of course, uh, they will need to uh, pay more money. So that's why they prefer to do it in-house. Plus also, in order when they do, when they do so, instead of uh, intervening in the actual ACC system, the liability still falls on the supplier. So that's why they, uh, they do it this way. But I would say definitely the best thing is to change the ACC system itself. Yeah, the, the, I think you, you point at a, at a very interesting aspect here. Mm. The systems, like ACC, mm. like other systems, should work really in, in, in true interaction with the vehicle and the sensors mm. that are available in the vehicle. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. More questions? <coughs> if not, no. no. Well, thank you again. Okay. Thank you.
Michael. We continue with you. He's quality driven, purpose oriented, and a perfectionist. I heard that a lot. Perfectionist, a beauty fire. His great insight and his creativity result to un in unique ideas and remarks. He can take everything one step forward. Always trying for per perfection, always cares about the smallest detail, about himself and the people around him. He's certainly the one with the most aesthetic attitude. I'm curious. Show us. <laughs> Thank you, Peter, for the, for the introduction. Good morning. Welcome to this symposium. Uh, I'm Mikhail Saretis, and today I will talk to you about my final project, which regards the design of a predictive control strategy for an automotive electrical assisted waste heat recovery system with uh, preview. And as Hazen previously mentioned, it's in collaboration with Daftrax, and it is done under the umbrella of the Imperium project. Um, it is about a waste heat recovery system. And the waste heat recovery system is a system that harvests energy from the exhaust gas of the engine and uses this in a way that, is, uh, that can be further utilized. And preview information is about information from the future, already available, that we know what will happen about the driving conditions, and we use this information in order to better control our system. Um, manufacturers are aligning around efficiency, and they try to find new ways in order to reduce fuel consumption, to reduce the emissions, and also to reduce the cost of ownership. And one promising technology, advanced technology, is the waste heat recovery system. In order to set the context for the project, I would like to show you this scheme. And the main parts are the engine and the waste heat recovery, uh, which is shown here in blue. When combustion takes place, heat is produced, and this heat is used as an input to the waste heat recovery system. And then, power is produced that can either be used for propulsion in order to assist the engine, or it can be, it can be stored in a battery in the way for uh, if we have an electrically assisted waste heat recovery system. The heat that is shown here is the EGR and the exhaust gas heat. The EGR is exhaust gas recirculation. Some part of the exhaust gas is directed back to the engine and used for emission control purposes. And this uh, block is the exhaust after treatment system which is used for emission reduction. What to, is also important and we take into consideration this project is preview information, which is expected to be beneficial for systems with energy buffers, such as the waste heat recovery and the battery. Preview is information that comes from antennas, uh, is information about the environment, information from maps, and can be used in order to control the system. Therefore, the objective is to design a control system for, a control system for uh, an electrical assisted waste recovery system that can exploit preview information. And before I zoom into the waste heat recovery system, I would like to uh, say a bit more about preview. So preview can come is information about the future driving conditions of the vehicle, and can come either from maps or information about the environment or information uh, that is shared between vehicles and infrastructure that is expected to rise in the future, and information uh, among vehicles, so vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication. However, uh, the quality, the request, and the horizon, which means for how long this information is available, is affected in reality by sudden, incident, by sudden incidents that, are not, uh, that cannot be expected. In this project, we translate all of these signals into the heat input, as I showed you previously, that is used as an input to the waste heat recovery system. Therefore, we know what will happen in the future, and we try to use this information. Um, in order to zoom into the waste heat recovery system, this is a scheme, a detailed scheme about the system. What we can see is the two evaporators. These are these two components, and these components extract heat from the exhaust gas and transfer this heat into a working fluid. In our case, it is ethanol. We can also see the expander. This is a component where power is produced by the system. And we can see the condenser, which uh, serves the purpose of cooling 
the fluid down after it is very hot because it is, uh, it is expanded. The electric part consists of the generator and the motor. And also we have the battery. So typically, what happens is that power is produced by the expander. And then this power can either be transferred to assist the engine from the generator to the motor, or it can be stored in the battery and can be utilized further on. And in order to exemplify how a waste heat recovery system works, I would like to show you this video. This is the engine and the exhaust gas, the EGR evaporator coming from the previous scheme, the after treatment system uh, to filter for emission control, the exhaust evaporator, the expander that produces the power, and the condenser that pulls down the liquid again. So heat comes from the exhaust gas, transferred to the fluid, and then power is produced in this component. And the, ba the, the basic, the important principle, the working principle about these systems is the organic rank and cycle. In a simplified scheme, we can see the evaporator, the turbine expander, the condenser, and the pump. These are the four main components. And the fluid is heat up. It is expanded, power is produced, and then the heat is cooled down again and pressurized again by the pump. And here we can see this happening in this uh, figure with all the different states. And it is crucial for such systems that before the expander, the vapor state of the liquid is guaranteed. Because for systems with turbine expanders, uh, these systems, the expander, the turbine is very sensitive to droplets. And as a result, if this is not in vapor state, then this will be bypassed and the system will not produce power. Therefore, we want to keep this, uh, to keep at this point, the liquid in vapor state. And this is why, this is what the superheating temperature represents. It represents a temperature, uh, a temperature margin above the saturation temperature of ethanol, which is the temperature at which ethanol, the our working fluid, starts to turn into vapor from liquid because it is boiling. And this temperature typically is set or it is calibrated in order to be kept as constant, such that a trade-off is kept between power output and performance and robustness. But it is shown that the lower this is, as long as it is positive, more power output is produced by the system. Therefore, we expect to use preview in combination with this observation. Um, on a waste heat recovery system level, which is also the core of this project, we can see, we can distinguish in this scheme the system, the two evaporators and the expander. And also regarding the control part of this system, we have this low level control layer, which consists of two controllers that regulate the mass flow of the ethanol in the system independently for its evaporator. And then the superheating set points that I mentioned previously are set here as, content, as constant. And this is the current configuration. This is how it is currently done. In order to define the problem and what we want to achieve, we set our goal. And our goal is to maximize the uh, waste heat recovery system's power, uh, power output by adjusting the superheating regardless of the transient of the varying heat input in the system. Therefore, we can say that we treat our system as a block, and then we have the inputs and the outputs. And what we want to maximize is the, the net power that we gain from our system, because the expander power is produced, so this is what we gain, and the pump power is the power that is added to the system, because it consumes energy. And we want to maximize this. Preview, as it was mentioned, is considered as a heat input to the system, and it is known in this case. So we know what will happen about the driving conditions, and we know what will be the heat that will be used, that will be used as an input to our system. We solve this problem because if I uh, select a superheating set point as constant for some time, which is the horizon, then I can predict, I can calculate in the future what will be the power output of the system. And therefore, for a short period of time, I can select 
my superheating set points to be uh, the best for power production. Then this problem is implemented in a receding horizon fashion, which means that the superheating set points are calculated for the preview horizon, and then they are applied for a control horizon or for a time step. And we selected uh, the preview horizon is 50 seconds, and the control horizon, which is this step, is 25 seconds. And as the track moves, also this uh, preview horizon moves. And as a result, in a repetitive way, in an iterative way, everything changes. Therefore, this is the strategy, the, the control system as it was previously, and with the addition of the new supervisory controller, this component is added here, it utilizes preview information in order to maximize the power output of the system. Two test cases are used in order to evaluate this method, a short one and a larger one, a more a lengthier, let's say, Case two is prescribed for the Imperium project in order to evaluate how uh, systems perform. And case, case one is a promising use case because it combines an uphill and a an, an downhill, and then uh, more power is produced during these cases, especially for a highly loaded truck that is going uphill. Uh, the strategy is tuned for the, first, for the first case, and then it is applied on the second case in order to validate its performance. And for the first case, if we look at the power output of the system, with the, the purple line, we can see that more power is increased, more power is produced, and no, uh, no bypass events practically happen, which means that the system is in constant power production because the set points are adjusted such that vapor is maintained before the expander, and as a result, it doesn't need to be bypassed. In terms of the benefit of preview, this figure shows, for this case, the recovered energy that we gain, and there is an 18.4% increase in the recovered energy using preview information, which can later on, if this energy is uh, used for propulsion, can be later on translated to significant fuel benefit. For the case two, we can see that, again, more power is produced from the red line, and also, all the bypass events are mitigated, which means that the system continuously produces power. And in that case, the benefit uh, accounts for 20% increase in recovered energy, because it is also a lengthier case. And therefore, this shows the potential of preview information in terms of uh, achieving lower fuel consumption for systems with energy buffers as the waste heat recovery system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? The whole police are. I, uh, I'm sitting here for uh, <laughs> for questions. So I, I, uh, <laughs> um, I have two questions basically. Yes. Um, you take a prediction horizon of fifty seconds, seconds. and twenty-five yes. control uh, horizon. Mm -hmm. What if you change this? I mean, do you have any feel for for sensitivity on the prediction horizon? Yes, if you increase, if you uh, it depends on the control horizon, the prediction horizon. If you increase the prediction horizon a lot, then while it would be expected that uh, more power would be produced, it produces less power. It si it uh, is similar to the constant superheating set point. So, if you on the other hand lower it a lot then a lot of bypasses are introduced because it changes all the time. So yeah, based on, yes, based on the sensitivity analysis, this was the selection that produced, this combination of horizons produced the more uh, recovered energy over the case. At least within the computation. Yes. Yeah. yes. Can you go back to, to slide 17 or so? Yes. Yeah, the, the, the other one, this one. This one. It's sort of, um, all in all, mm -hmm. What you show is, okay, you have, with the preview, you produce more power so that you can re, uh, how to say, re, recover more energy. Uh, later on. Mm -hmm. So, of course, the, the, the obvious thing is why to produce more, uh, more power, but in fact, mm -hmm. not at all 
you have so much power overall is that a possibility you foresee because now you you're going sort of in, in a cycle you produce more uh, with this preview you pr pr produce more power mm -hmm. and then finally you want to go to the recovery uh, situation mm -hmm. and uh, the 20 percent or so you wanted to use it one way or another can i avoid this in 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 in, in one way or another um if i understand the question correctly the power that is so this this line if you integrate it then you get the power that you yeah, sure. yeah so uh, this is the power of um this is the energy that is recovered more but more specifically could you could you clarify your well question? i mean it's sort of a loop eh, what you create you, yes. you have more power uh, with the preview mm -hmm. generated mm -hmm. so to say then you have to recover it and i sort of would like to avoid that all in all, but keep my vehicle driving at a desired speed acceleration without too much of this uh, power um, or energy recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, if I understand you correctly, this picture shows the recovered. The recovered energy. Ah, this is the recovered yes. energy. Yes. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> we weren't on the same page, yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> But it wasn't said. No, no, no. Yeah. Okay. Um, you choose to control the set points. Mm -hmm. Can you also change the, the settings of the controllers? <laughs> and what would be the benefit there? Do you foresee that you could increase this? It could, yes, it could increase it because it will change the optimum and the set points will be selected lower then. So I believe that it would be, uh, if you change also the parameters of the low-level controllers, there would be a further improvement in this scheme. Okay. No more questions? Then let's thank Michael again. <laughs> and we continue with SAPFO. SAPFO Tutu working on blind spot detection systems for trucks, again for DAF. And what do your colleagues say about you? Hmm. An organizational guru. A great leader and team player, eager to take responsibilities, most in control, and she knows what's important. Very organized with a well-structured plan and approach, and in addition to good technical knowledge and skills, has the potential of becoming a good manager. Subfo can carry out any task. Sociable, supportive, and well organized. An example of professionalism. Okay, do you want more? <laughs> <laughs> the floor is yours. So, good morning from my side. Thank you, Peter, for the introduction, and thank you, everyone, for your kind words. Uh, today I will present to you what I've been doing the past 10 months, uh, as uh, Hazem and Peter said, in collaboration with DAF. I've been working on blind spot detection system for trucks under the supervision of uh, Dino Sepats and uh, Albert van de Knapp from uh, the DAF side, and then uh, Heis Dubelman and Hank Neymacher from TUE side. Um, the agenda is as follows. I'm going to start with a small... Uh, description of the problem we're facing, then go into the project definition, and I'm going to show you the functional context and the requirements that dictated my design. And then a bit of the high-level design, because of confidentiality reasons I cannot show a lot. Uh, and then a small video, which also is a bit blurred, <laughs> confidentiality reasons again. But let's start with the problem. So the problem we are facing is that uh, people die on the streets uh, around uh, 4,200 VRUs die every year in Europe, hit by trucks, and here you see some examples of that. So the problem is so big that it's been now discussed uh, in legislation, or it's been discussed for years in legislation, and the problem is caused by this um, gray area you see there. Not sure how to press this, but the gray area you see there is the blind spot. So the blind spot is an area that the uh, uh, driver cannot see directly or indirectly and for now they have been using mirrors in order to solve this problem 
but the thing is, mirrors might not be well adjusted. Sometimes they give you a more distorted image, and the fact that the driver has to look at six mirrors at all the times, then you can imagine the high workload for him, so he's going to miss something. So if the solution is not the mirrors, then what is? Oh, the answer is a blind spot detection system that will basically prevent collisions with uh, VRUs by warning the driver in case of an upcoming collision. So for this project, I worked on two main things. I worked on the system architecture design and then an algorithm design. And for the system architecture design, I studied what legislation says, what does the customer want, what are the main uh, use cases we have to cover, and the requirements that the system needs to fill. Then I decomposed uh, uh, the system into functional components, what needs to be there, and what are the interfaces between them. And then on the algorithm design uh, side, I studied the different strategies for collision avoidance. I chose one, implemented, and tested it. Here you see the functional context so that you get a better understanding. Um, so the blind spot detection system receives information through an external sensor that perceives the environment. On the other side, it receives information regarding the vehicle state and the driver's input through internal sensors. Then we have some magic happening in that orange box, and we get a warning level that goes back to the driver through the HMI. We're talking about a city environment, of course, and within a city, we have to take into account we have a cluttered environment, and by cluttered environment, we, need, we mean boards, trees, other parked cars. Um, of course, since we are in a city, there is a limited speed range, so from zero to 30, both for the vehicle and then for the VRU as well, because VRUs, as I said before, they could be pedestrians, but also cyclists and motorcyclists. Then since we're talking about the safety system, we have to keep uh, to the minimum the false negatives and false positive warnings. And false negatives means, uh, uh, false negative means basically when you have to give a warning, but you don't get it. And in the false positive is when you just get warning when there's nothing actually there. So both cases, they have to be minimized. Um, going forward, we need the system to be uh, processing in real time. And of course, since we're talking about upcoming collisions, we need to predict ahead. So let's go to this uh, predict ahead point. We need to provide a warning to the driver. That's the main uh, goal. But in order to do that, we need to know what kind of warning and when to give it. So for that, we need again to see, is there gonna be a collision or not? And for that, of course, we need to know what is the path that the VRU is gonna take and what is the path the truck is going to take. So for the truck, we use, as I said before, information about the vehicle state. And then for the VRU, we have to sense the environment, we have to do some processing, detect the object and so on and so forth. In smaller words, we need something on the HMI, and HMI stands for Human Machine Interface, so a display or something. For that, we need to decide the warning, we need to see if there's gonna be a collision, and predict the paths of the VRU and of the vehicle. So then the architecture looks something like that. So the algorithm design I focused on is on these four blocks. And as I said before, because of confidentiality reasons, I'm not gonna go into detail of these blocks, but I'm gonna show you what we get at the last point. So, on the HMI. We get four different warning levels. Level warning one is, uh, warning level one, is uh, when the system is on. Warning level two, basically inform the driver, there is something close to you. Warning level three is when there is something close and it's a collision will happen, so we warn the driver to start braking. And warning level four is the most intensive warn, where we basically tell him, there's gonna be a collision, which you might avoid if you hit the brakes now. Do you have any questions? <laughs> sure. Don't try. Many questions. Thank you for the uh, presentation. Uh, I wonder what happens in case of uh, the first part that you show in, for example, in a highway, there was the cars around the, 
uh, in the beginning of the presentation, there were there were cars around the car truck. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, this situation, you analyze this case for up until 30 kilometers per hour, but what happens with this algorithm in case of a highway? Because uh, in that kind of situation, the uh, uh, collision will be more dangerous also. Yeah, uh, that's true, but they have uh, other systems uh, working about the uh, highways, and mine is mostly meant for a city environment. Okay. Hello, support. Thank you for the presentation. I have one question. In one of the slides, you mentioned the four levels of warnings, mm -hmm. but you said that the first level is not that important. Well, it is very important, but not for a demo. That's uh, the okay. point. Okay, then it's clear. Of course. You need to know that the system is working otherwise. More questions? Uh, can you just raise my voice? It's fine. Okay. I'm just wondering if that human-machine interface is also replicated inside of the cabin, or is it just meant for the people outside of the vehicle for them to be able to see it, or is that just because of the demo. Yeah, that's just because of the demo. So this, uh, they're working now on a concept of uh, the HMI that will be inside, but now just to visualize what we get actually on the inside, that's why we put the LEDs outside. And then for the future, would it be interesting to also integrate this into a brake by wire system such that the vehicle itself just brakes? Yes, of course, because that's an important uh, driver's reaction, takes a lot of time. So they are, uh, after they take this into the next level, so after they make it perfect, so no errors, because if you just break, you might cause something else. So when they reach the point where they know that uh, it's working perfectly, they will do that. At the moment, you let the truck sense the environment. Can mm -hmm. you also foresee that you can use other means to inform the truck of... Uh, vulnerable road, road users, for instance, using uh, V2X communication or x 2 Yeah, yeah. Actually, they're doing this now. Um, so three, through V2, uh, vehicle to infrastructure communication, they see like we have like a batch of pedestrians in the next traffic light and they can inform. But all this is a concept phase. They're still developing it. Yeah. yeah. Actually, the, the, the previous question is quite interesting. Would you think that, say, the, the, the cyclist or so would be happy with a sort of a sign, the truck, the driver of the truck sees me, so I really have an outside signaling uh, effect? I think that's important because um, at the moment of the, the recorded accidents they have, the cyclist never reduced his speed. And I think that's because he didn't actually understand that he's in the blind spot. So it would be very important for him to know, okay, he has seen me or he hasn't seen me, yeah, to react appropriately, yeah. More questions? Uh, so what kind of sensors are you using for blind spot detection? Are these weird radars or camera? Uh, you can use different kind of sensors, but uh, I cannot tell you which one we used here. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, let's thanks up for again. Thank you. We have one more presentation before the break. Ramis Ismail, uh, working for NXP on the next generation of lane centering assist system. And let me see what your colleagues think about Ramis. Confident. That's true. Strong-minded, persistent, hard-working technical idealist that happens to be also a technical guru. Ramiz always amazes people with his work. His skills, his vision, and his drive to make everything perfect keep him running non-stop. Diligent and a creative mind. Team player, very pleasant to cooperate with, and a strong technical background. He has solid skills and knowledge, especially in computer vision related fields. And I think that's something we're going to see right now. Ramis. So, good morning, everyone. Um, 
thanks for the kind words, very kind words, and, uh, and for the introduction, Peter. Uh, my name is Ramiz Ismail. Um, I've been working, my PDN assignment was Next Generation Lane Centering Assist System. And this project was executed at NXP, NXP Semiconductors, uh, in collaboration with Technical University of Eindhoven. So NXP is a semiconductor company and is the leading vendor to automotive sector. Um, the products include uh, sensor devices, microcontrollers, microprocessors, um, wireless communication between vehicles, with infrastructure, and all kinds of electronics that you can think of in automotive. I would also like to mention my supervisors here. Um, from TUE, this project was supervised by Heist Dubelman, and from NXP, Han Reimarkus and uh, Gerde Dalkop. So uh, I will start now with the actual presentation. The goal of this uh, assignment was to design and develop a next generation lane centering assist system using NXP Blue Box. Now I will shortly introduce what is NXP Blue Box, but let's first see what is a lane centering assist system. It's a system that tries to prevent you from uh, drifting or straying from the driving lane. Um, there are various studies that indicate that the major reason for road accidents is driver's uh, distraction. And as Sophos mentioned, um, that uh, people die on the street and there are a lot of accidents, uh, and this is one of the, the system tried to prevent one of the consequences of the uh, driver's distraction. And actually, with the growing technology, the number of uh, distractions is increasing. Uh, last year, uh, I was uh, reading this news that uh, there was an accident because people were trying to play Pokemon, the Pokemon Go. I don't know this game very well, but it's a virtual reality game where they, uh, there are some virtual beings and they, they were, drivers were actually trying to catch this while driving. And there's some number of distractions that are there, it's, it's growing. And um, in my days it was only a uh, cell phone or uh, uh, yeah, a sound system, simple sound system, but now it's uh, Facebook, Twitter, um, WhatsApp, so all kind of distraction you can think of. Um, so when we can say that these, uh, you can try to avoid the, educate people to avoid these distractions, but this is human psychology. Some people are more prone to uh, distractions, some are less prone to, and there are different triggers. Some get triggered by uh, maybe a sports car, or uh, uh, some get triggered by, um, yeah, the beauty or curiosity, but it's, it's, it's all uh, different triggers. So we cannot be objective that having Pokemon is stupid and we can educate people because it's again the human psychology. So what we can do is we can actually um, try to prevent the consequences. And one of the consequences that you're driving in the lane uh, and you're not paying attention, so your car might drift away from the lane you're driving in. And that you can prevent and there are systems that, to prevent that. For example, lane departure warning systems. Uh, they warn you uh, and alert the driver when this is going to happen. There are lane keeping assist systems that uh, course correct you. They provide some kind of assistive steering. But the distinguishing characteristic of the lane centering system that is under discussion here is that it's a continuous proactive steering system that aims at keeping the car always centered in the lane, so continuously. Um, so uh, as introduced by Hazem, the cruise control, uh, adoptive cruise control system, if you combine this lane centering system with an adoptive cruise control system, you will have a, um, as what, what is uh, defined as a level two automation, which is partial automation. So you can actually physically disengage from the car and the car will uh, uh, drive itself um, a good example of this uh, SAE level two system is Tesla autopilot, where you can actually uh, physically disengage from uh, operating the car, but of course you have to be mentally still present because this is partial automation, not complete automation. However, the trend is moving towards complete automation, uh, towards self-driving cars, and there is a technology gap there, um, and the gap is that uh, computation power that is available in the cars that is going to compute all those algorithms 
is not enough, they cannot meet the demands uh, here. And to bridge that gap, NXP come up with a, a next generation prototyping platform that is specially targeting soft driving cars and advanced driver system systems. And this uh, platform is called Blue Box, and this is the platform that I use in my assignment to, to uh, develop this functionality. So uh, I will explain, uh, give a small overview of this platform. It has two system on chips. One is Layerscape and other is S32V system on chip. Um, okay, I'll not use it. Um, the, the Layerscape is a general has general purpose processors and it's mainly meant for high level thinking and interacting with the outer world. While the S32V is a automotive grade uh, uh, system uh, that uh, is mainly meant for perception tasks. Uh, it's uh, designed with the safety, automotive safety and reliability in mind. And it's a very heterogeneous platform, which means it has different computational units. For example, ISP, image signal processor, Apex, GPUs, and general, general purpose processors like ARM processors. So this is a bit of overview about uh, what is Blue Box. So now that we have covered the preliminaries and I've given the idea what is this project about, let's see how we can achieve such a system that prevents you from straying off the lane. Um, so here I show the interaction of the system with the, yeah, I found. So, uh, so there is a lane centering system that is, I'm designing uh, and I was working on with NXP and TV and those blocks around it shows its interaction with the environment. Everything here is in the, in the, the Toyota Pierce. This is the test vehicle that we had, uh, which is being equipped with various platforms and sensor devices. So the driver interacts with the system through a human machine interface. So it can request uh, the system to activate this lane centering, uh, to take control of the steering of the car. Um, and the main sensor is, that is used is camera. So we get, a, it's a forward-facing camera that uh, retrieves an image, and we compute the length uh, boundaries there, we compute the target path, we compute what is the our path, where we are in the lane, and then we generate a, a steering that is needed to control the car, and we convey the steer by wire, and that is the actuator in, the, in, the, uh, in this uh, system. Furthermore, there are other sensors. Um, there is a, uh, positioning sensors, uh, inertial measurement unit that are used to um, kind of verify that what we calculated uh, is right. So we calculated the target path using camera, but we can also reinforce it using other sensors. So, and also important is we log the data to for uh, later verification and validation. Uh, in the lab, so we cannot always drive um, for some tasks, we have to be in the lab, and that's where this logging data will be useful. So going forward, um, from these interactions, first we drive according to functional safety, we, we drive a functional architecture, then we drive complete architecture for the system. And the, what I'm showing here is, is the smaller part of the system that is realized in this assignment. Um, and and it's, it's more complex than that, but for the, because I have a limited time here, I'm showing only the, the simplified and, and the most important uh, part of the, of the system. So what you have here is a camera, um, and you get an image from the camera inside the S32V system on chip, which is a part of the blue box. You detect and track lane markings. When you have the lane markings, you, uh, you uh, can estimate your position in the lane and also the target path, which is done here in the lateral kinematics module. Then you give this arrow between um, your ground path and the target path to the lateral controller, which produce a uh, um, steering angle that is required and is conveyed through a move box to the Toyota Prius steer by wire system. This is how the system works. The core of the system is the algorithm which tracks and track lane boundaries. Um, and I will only discuss this part of, of the system uh, due to time restrictions. So let's first see what is the working principle here. It's a completely probabilistic based algorithm 
where we have a region of interest and we, com we have two calibrated lines, a baseline and preview line, and we compute multimodal histograms on these lines. So, and this is computed totally probabilistically on different high levels from pixel level to segment level and finally the object level, and that's how we classify objects. So to uh, give a feeling about how the state of the art algorithm is different than the classical approaches, I will show you video or recording on the same data sets. First, we will see the classical lane tracker. This lane tracker is actually implemented and being optimized on the blue box before I started the project. And we will see the, uh, the performance, functional performance of it. But first, few comments about the, about the uh, algorithm, so the latency, which is the time that the algorithm needs to determine where the lane boundaries are. So this is the time it takes to think about where the lane boundaries are, is 20 milliseconds. Um, the requirement here is, is almost 60 milliseconds, so this is within requirements. So it performs well on the strain roads, but it has a visible degradation when you go to the uh, curves. So I will play the video, and you will see that while it's uh, on the straight road, um, it performs good. It can detect where the lane boundaries are. Here you see that uh, while we are transferring it to another lane, it, it lost the track, so it doesn't know where the next lane is. So I just pause it to highlight this uh, limitation here. And also on the curve, it can get an idea where the line boundary is, but the direction of travel is not. So for example, in this case, it's totally pointing towards a direction that if you travel in that direction, you will probably have a crash. And you want, don't want to travel there, you want to travel to in, in the curve, not out of the curve. So uh, this, is, uh, this was the classical approach. Now I will show you the the, the research algorithm that is under uh, the research at Technical University of Eindhoven. And uh, the good thing here is that it performs well on the bands and also it can handle lane transitions. But the latency here, the amount of time it needs to compute is, is a lot more than, than the, the classical approach we, uh, we saw. So it's almost 250 milliseconds, but it doesn't meet the requirement that it should be uh, 60 milliseconds. So let's see the video sequence with the same data set. Um, so you would see various probability modules here. So first, when it shifts to the other lane, it nicely detected that, that there is another lane. This functionality will be very useful when designing a uh, lane change assist system, for example. Um, and now you will see one limitation of this algorithm that it actually performs very good on the bands, but in this case, it has a limitation that it actually is tracking the outside lane. And it, because and the problem here is it, 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 the probability maps are calculated based on your prior knowledge, your belief, and what you see. And here it's relying a lot on the prior knowledge. This problem is being fixed. I will show it in, in the next video that the functional uh, improvements were made to this algorithm, and this problem has been solved. But you will notice that the rest of the curve is quite, it handles it quite well. And then the direction of travel, it can actually determine, it can adjust the vanishing point according to the direction of travel. So, um, some results. My main task was to optimize this algorithm on the blue box and uh, for normal PCs. And to uh, it's include also uh, functional optimization and non-functional optimization. So first we see the non-functional optimization, which is the time that it needs to run, uh, it needs to uh, uh, process one frame. Originally it was 250 milliseconds while running on a MATLAB and a Core i7 PC. Uh, with the proposed design, making alterations and updating it, uh, we were able to have an implementation that runs on, on an x86-64 PC, Core i7, the same uh, specs PC with only seven milliseconds. We compute the whole uh, frame uh, and it's just seven milliseconds. Then again, this is a big PC with consuming 300 or 400 watts, and we want to do it on a small embedded system that doesn't take much money, and we can put it in our car. 
and that's where the blue box comes in. So on the S32V, without using any accelerators, we had 50 milliseconds, but with using accelerators, we are again to 25 milliseconds. So the state of the art algorithm is actually with all the nice specs of the platform, you can have a 25 milliseconds of latency, which is um, quite good for real-time application in these cases. So finally, I will show you the final video of, uh, of same data set. This is, again, with the functional and non-functional optimization. One thing that you will notice here is that this line represents um, the active bin. So these are calibrated lines here, these two. And uh, let me just play the video and I will explain it. So normally this line is, if the camera is installed in the center of the, on the symmetry plane, this line should be in the middle. And you will see it that the, uh, there's a, you're diverting from the lane, or you are uh, scaling off, when you see that this line has shifted from the middle to, the, to one of side of the, of the frame. And uh, yeah, so if you are actually in the lane, you are driving in the lane, you will see it in the uh, middle, but if you are diverging, then it will shift on one side. And you, if you see here that the, that problem, region problem has been solved, and um, the algorithm, whenever you shift, it changes its uh, bends to one of the sides. So this is it. Um, we'll just let it run for a while and explain you a few things about the algorithm. The good thing is that even if there are no lanes, and you will see in uh, incoming sequence, uh, it can actually make sense of, because it knows the average width and the standard deviation in the lane, so it can make a sense out of where it should be the lane. Normally in the classical approach, you just try to detect lines and you don't uh, know anything about the lane itself, that a lane has a certain width and certain properties. So for example, here you don't have a lane, but it, does, it doesn't altogether collapse or just point, start pointing random lines in the other direction. It actually try to fit a, a, a normal lane somewhere. Of course, it still need improvement. It's not perfect. There are so many mistakes this algorithm does, but uh, and we are, I think we are still very far behind in, in the perception technology. I mean, if we see humans, we can, if we just take out all the senses, we can still drive just by our eyes. But in case of cars, it's still uh, um, not there yet. So we have a long way to go. So thank you, everyone, for the uh, attention. And if you have questions, feel free to ask. Questions? No, uh, no, it's uh, it's one of the tasks that I would uh, do in future. But for now, we had this one data set that was recorded in driving in Eindhoven, and we have tested on in this. Of course, the algorithm performance will will be different, and we will need maybe some different optimizations and calibration when it's the lighting conditions have changed or the, um, yeah, for example, the weather conditions have changed. So that needs some more tests. Okay. And one question, um, with so much focus on deep learning, do you think it would be better if you also stick towards deep learning? <laughs> yeah, it's probably he's working on the deep learning, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, I think deep learning is very promising, and the main thing is the scalability and extensibility, and that is where we, this is a probabilistic approach, and we calculate probabilities on different uh, maps. So it's a uh, gray channel, gradient channel, direction. And one channel can also be the deep uh, coming from the training. So what we have right now is coming from our knowledge of what the lane looks like and what is the average width. We can also put, and that's, uh, that's also one of the future goals, to put a, uh, a channel that is not trained by us, but by reference images. So this is one of the one of the goal, but I think this is very.
deep learning, what it offers is the scalability. And in automotive, you have so many different situations, so many different scenarios, lighting conditions, and scalability is really important. Because even if the algorithm is 90% or 98% perfect, you, don't, you cannot put it in your car because it's still making mistakes in every 100, two times in every uh, 100 frames. So it's not uh, enough for the automotive. Thank you. Thank you. Quite interesting. There are, for me, a couple of parameters sort of out of view at the moment. That is, say, the camera. Mm -hmm. How good is the camera? I mean, you, you're basically focusing on computational um, yeah. efficiency, may I say that. The camera and the look ahead of the camera is very crucial, and the, the, the speed of the vehicle, of course. Yes. Can you comment on that? Yes, so uh, yeah, look ahead distance is very crucial. So what you see here, uh, we, we have two calibrated lines. So we have camera and two calibrated lines. And right now it's looking around at 30 meters, but it also depends on what I'm doing right now is, uh, this is on the recorded data set, but what I'm doing right now is calibrating on, on, on the car. So there you can adjust actually the look ahead distance. You can move this uh, per view line a bit up. Also you can adjust the, well, it depends how your camera is mounted. For now, it's uh, the camera is mounted that half of them is at least the road. But um, if it's totally looking down on the road, and it's so you can move it until the horizon, and then you can, if after horizon, if you don't have uh, the uh, vanishing point, then you cannot move it further. So I think you can go until I don't have an exact number, but you can go until 60 meters, and uh, yeah. So after that, it's, uh, but I think for controlling the car, even 30 meter is, is enough. So you can, speed, huh? yes, it depends on the speeds. And then if the speed is the concern, then also the computation time. So if you decrease the computation time, for example, and you're continuously updating it very regularly, and maybe you don't need to look very far in the, uh, in the future. Yeah, but the thing is that the controller is, is deployed, but it still needs some testing. And then we will actually know what is the, what is the good look ahead distance. More questions? Yes. <laughs> So the data that is logged uh, is mainly for verification. So for example, this, this data set was logged while driving in the Eindhoven. And uh, yes, you can use that data to train it, to find patterns about the lanes. And you can use, so that is very important. This is how the deep learning thing is getting popular. So you get these data from driving cars and you train your things and uh, your network or your algorithm to adjust to those, uh, to, to those uh, scenarios. And yes, this is helpful, and especially in deep learning, when you see that your algorithm doesn't work in certain scenarios, you can train it and you can get those data and you can, you can um, optimize it for that data sets. What, what is the most limiting factor in your and the whole uh, LCAR system. Mm -hmm. All the, the, the thing that took most effort and I think you still need a lot of attention is this, this uh, algorithm. So the perception is still uh, not, uh, yeah, not very robust and it still need more attention. And this is also the core enabler of the system. So without, if you don't know where you're driving the lane, you cannot um, do anything, you cannot control it. Actually, we humans are quite smart, right? Yes. Okay. For okay. now. Let's thank Ramit again, and we'll have a break.